there is a maturational imbalance. And that is the single most important thing. That gap, that imbalance, you know, we know that in most kids with autism, there's no injury to the brain. Actually, we look at the MRIs, we look at the brain scans, they look normal and good. We know there's no, most most often no metabolic cause, there's no genetic mutation in the majority. So what is the actual problem? And the problem is that gap in development. And that's what our research is showing. And what leads to that primarily is really these retained reflexes. Hello and welcome to Autism Parenting Secrets. It's Len, and I'm so happy to welcome back to the show, Dr. Robert Malolo. For decades, he's been doing pioneering work in developmental functional neurology, brain imbalances, hemispheric integration, and the correction of most neurobehavioral disorders and learning disabilities. He's the author of many groundbreaking books, including the bestseller, Disconnected Kids. And he now sees patients from all over the globe, both adults and children, at his private practice, the Melillo Center for Developing Minds. We've received so much positive feedback from his first appearance. That was episode 133, Correct Imbalances First. And if you haven't listened to that episode, you might want to do that first because this discussion will definitely build upon that one. So in that prior conversation, we covered what the Melillo method was and how it helps. And this discussion is really going to be a deeper dive into what the program entails. It's more of a behind the scenes look at what's involved for you and your child. And we're using myself and my son, Rai, as the example, because we recently spent a week with Dr. Melillo and his amazing team. And the secret this week is horizontal and vertical brain integration. Welcome, Dr. Malolo. Oh, thank you, Len. Thank you so much for having me. As I said, this is now personal with your family and us. Truly, no, we truly bonded. My son had the most uh, amazing experience. It was just really beautiful, a magical week. And I know at the end, when you provided a recap, uh, you kind of focused on one key thing. You said like the most important thing for us to do, the most significant thing was really focusing on helping our son lose those retained primitive reflexes, that that was really our primary objective. Mm -hmm. The way I interpret that is, okay, right now for Rye, that very well could be the single biggest thing that's in the way of his continued growth and progress. And that his ability to, to thrive is really constrained as long as they're present. So could you expand on that concept a little bit? Sure. Uh, You know, we've published, I think, seven papers just this year alone on looking at retained primitive reflexes and their relationship to autism and really trying to understand what is actually happening, right? We tried to answer some questions. The first question is, you know, well, can they be retained after one? Because, you know, some people say no. We pretty much have proven they are. We're looking at groups, children, adolescents, and adults, in our study. Um, But then, um, you know, so what? They're retained. What does it mean? Right. And that is really something that has shown us that there is a developmental delay or maturational delay that is present if these reflexes are retained. Reflexes are supposed to go away as the brain develops and matures. After the first year, they should be gone. If they don't go away, what it means is that the brain is not maturing in the way that it should. But because the right side of the brain develops in the first three years, and then the left side of the brain develops in the, in the next three years, that's the reason why we end up with a very asymmetric brain. And that is unique in the degree of it to humans. And one of our greatest advantages um, that During that process, if there is something that causes a delay in that early stage, it's going to have more of an impact typically on the right brain and hold that back and slow it down, Uh, which then in many kids with autism, you know, what we find in the way I start off is that these individuals, even the ones that are non-speaking and really seem, you know, in their own world, are really gifted. They have these genius level left brain skills. And we know it by their family. We know it by looking at their traits. And 
that can break through too early. So the two things that happen is that one is that what's holding back the brain and what's really causing this maturational delay and then imbalance are these retained primitive reflexes. That is the foundational issue. And then that leads to an imbalance because what we often see is many of these reflexes are asymmetric. And that was another question we wanted to address. If they're asymmetric, meaning they're more on one side than the other or more delayed on one side than the other, what does that actually mean, if anything? And what it means is that there is a maturational imbalance. And that is the single most important thing. That gap, that imbalance, you know, we know that in most kids with autism, there's no injury to the brain. Actually, we look at the MRIs, we look at the brain scans, they look normal and good. We know there's no, most most often no metabolic cause. There's no genetic mutation in the majority. So what is the actual problem? And the problem is that gap in development. And that's what our research is showing. And what leads to that primarily is really these retained reflexes. Now, now you say that, and I understand that, but the broader you know, awareness is that you know, it is a brain issue, right? Like, so, so that, that I think I just want to pause on that. That is news, not news to you. You've been doing this work for a while and confirming it. But again, for many of our listeners, perhaps that's something really to take in because if if that's true and you have ample evidence that that's true, my goodness, what incredible opportunities there are again, to help your child go from wherever they are to some much better place. Yeah, you know, and that is, I think, one big misconception. There's a couple, but one is that there is a brain injury. And that's part of the reason, you know, the first question I ask almost every family when they get here is, has anybody tried to explain to you what's actually happening in your child's brain? And the answer, even if people, I had a woman yesterday that has spent over $2 million and her son is still in a residential center at 15 years old, right? And I said to her, has anybody tried to explain to you what is happening in his brain? And she said, no, no one ever tried to explain that. So it really comes down with what is the problem? And it's not an injury. And the reason why most people don't know what it is, is because of that. If it was a brain injury, it would be easy, right? We could look at the brain and say, that's the problem. There's the injury. But one of the reasons why it's so mysterious and the reason why people don't tell parents what's happening is because they don't know what the issue is. They really don't know. They don't really have an idea because it seems like this mystery. But there is not an injury in the brain. And in most cases, there is no genetic mutation. So you look at it and say, okay, then why can't we improve it? I mean, what is, you know, what's really preventing us from from making a difference? Right. Right. No, it's 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 powerful. And when you talk about the primitive reflexes being there, and again, because now we spent a week with you, one thing I thought was interesting is I read your book and I understood more, you know, by reading your book, the concepts of these various primitive reflexes, their names, how they work. And I was looking at my son and just basically saying, yeah, I don't think he really has them. You know, it just it, it wasn't obvious to me. And again, once you got your eyes and ears on him uh, and, and your team, um, clearly that wasn't the case. Right. There was ample room for him to improve. But it's a weird thing where it's not something you can really especially if you don't know exactly what to look for. You may not even notice that these these primitive reflexes are there. Yeah, that's exactly true. You know, it's. um you can't look at a child and say they have retained reflexes. Uh, you have to really know how to assess them appropriately. And that's really been uh, one of the biggest parts of my journey. Uh, and I've been talking about this and teaching it and researching it for over 20 years. But what really has been refined with the Melilla method over the past you know, five to seven years is really the understanding as to how specific you need to be when you're testing for these reflexes, really knowing the amount of pressure you have to use, the location that you have to actually stimulate, and then how that also translates into getting rid of them or integrating them or treating them, um, that you really need to be very specific. And even the way I used to teach it, you know, five to 10 years ago is so different from what we do now. And we get even much better results because 
of the specificity. And until you really test if these reflexes are there accurately, uh, you, you really don't know. There's really no way of knowing. I mean, there's some clues, obviously, in things like the way they sit or how they sit in class or if they have difficulty with certain things. We know there are certain symptoms that are somewhat associated with each reflex. But again, you know, most parents, you can't just look at your child and say, um, you know, that they have retained reflexes. I mean, if there was some obvious delays in their motor milestone, um, if they're uncoordinated, if they're clumsy, you know, if there are these clear muscle tone imbalances, uh, which there aren't on every kid, then you know that these retained reflexes are there. But, you know, they can be there in a kid that doesn't seem to have any of those issues and didn't have any motor milestone delays, but may have speech delays or other delays. Right, right. And I know when my wife and I were looking at this opportunity saying, okay, well, how can we take advantage of it? I know you um, serve parents and, and children and you do things virtually, uh, but you also have your your uh, clinic where people can come in person. And the way I look at it is just like right now, I mean, it's amazing what you can do virtually. And there's even functional medicine doctors or MAPS doctors, you know, who will do virtual consults um, and, and can really be that guide virtually. But even with those people, you still, it's so much more powerful if you can see them in person because you just can't replace the the, the insights, what, what you can see firsthand, which is why we thought about just t- kind of working with you virtually because it would be much more convenient. Uh, we're down in North Carolina. You're in Long Island, New York. Uh, but, um, but I was kind of blown away by the insights from that in-person visit. So even though it's an inconvenient, it's an investment, it's it's a lot to pick up your, you know, and travel for. And I know you have clients from all over the globe who are traveling much further than uh, we did, but really it is that specificity, what uniquely is going on with your child. And that's really hard for you to be able to pinpoint uh, a number of things if it's virtual, right? You got to see it in person. Yeah, you know, listen, I mean, it would be easier for everybody if we could do everything virtually. But when we're dealing with, you know, physical movement and touch and the sensory stimulation uh, of the body, um, there's nothing that replaces that one on one, you know, being able to actually see a patient, being able to actually, you know, actually examine the child and really look at their muscle tone and and see what their feelings look like. And look at their eye movements and whether, you know, their vestibular system is working properly. Um, That's one of the things that I see that most parents say, you know, my child never really had a full exam. I mean, the doctor made the diagnosis from across the room. You know, they just observed my child and that was their diagnosis. And, you know, when you're looking at a neurological exam, you can't do it just by observing. You have to look at reflexes. You have to hit the reflexes. You have to actually test the muscle tone. You have to look at the eye movements and the inner ear function. And a lot of also what we do is we train families to use my technique. And like anything else, there it's a training process. You know, it's like, you need to be able to do hands on and hand over hand and show parents how to do it properly and make sure they have the right touch and the right location and the right feel about when they're doing it. And that makes all the difference in the world. It's just hugely important. And even if we can, if we get to do that only one time, you know, but again, that usually takes a few days to get it. And we can do it virtually and we get great results virtually, but we find when the patients come here and we work with the parents on how to actually work on the reflexes and do some other things, you know, even in the best case scenario, they're doing it about 60 or 70 percent correct, which quite honestly gets them pretty good results and and better results than than most other approaches. But obviously that 30, 40 percent makes a huge difference. Right. Right. And it makes a huge difference in terms of, you know, I think the way parents might be listening to this, I would say it makes a huge difference in speed, like in terms of how rapidly progress can happen uh, comes to doing whatever you're doing and doing it really well. You know, instead of doing a number of interventions kind of halfway, um, you know, it's, it's a much better strategy to do a few things really, really well. And I know I benefited significantly from seeing firsthand how to do um, the particular exercises with my son correctly because uh, right. it 
the, the amount of pressure that's applied um, and, and the technique does matter. And yes, I could learn it virtually and get better and better. Uh, but that's, that was, you know, from my standpoint, it made sense to um, come in person if I wanted this whole approach to, um, to, to help my son as rapidly as possible, you know, because we're all impatient. Parents are crazy impatient. So I said, okay, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Uh, but I could totally see if we were not able to make the trip that we absolutely could do your program at home and you have great training for that. So, yeah. um, so, so yeah, I think in terms of the, the whole process, I want to just kind of share a little bit from our perspective, you know, once we signed up and, and lined up a time to come up, to come up uh, to, um, to your center, I know there was some pre work that we did, you know, other than intake forms and giving you a lot of information, but I know we had started um, with our son um, helping to do some interventions that were going to help get him ready uh, and, and prepared for the visit. So we, I know, did highlights, which I'd love for you to talk about, um, and other ways that we were um, helping to stimulate. And he did fall into that category you mentioned where his uh, um, he is left brain dominant. Um, and so we were trying to stimulate more the right side and maybe help the left side kind of come down a little bit. So can you talk about, um, you know, the the ways that you the, the different tools you have? And I know for us, we had some of those that we started even before we showed up at your clinic. Right. So, you know, what we're trying to do is, again, address the core issue. And what is the core issue, as we talked about last time, is this imbalance that develops between the networks of the brain from either side of the brain, because the brain develops, you know, the right side develops first, and then the left side develops. Um, that is where the weakness lies. That's where things can go awry. And that's where the connections and the communication can be disrupted. It's vulnerable. Um, and so what we want to do is try to restore that communication. And we want to get the whole brain working because the whole brain should always be working. But what we see is, um, there's this unevenness of skills in autism. There's areas and networks of the brain that are underdeveloped and immature and slower. And then there's areas that are overdeveloped or hyperconnected and faster. And so what we find is that it involves multiple networks in multiple areas of the brain. And we're really looking at kind of the whole hemisphere becomes impacted. So working on one area alone doesn't really make sense when we have multiple areas and multiple networks that are impacted. And nobody wants to get faster results than me, right? So how do we do that? So what I found years ago was combining multiple uh, modalities that impact different networks. We have a visual network in the back. So we know that there's visual processing issues in kids with autism where they have good global processing or, or they have poor global processing, but really good detail processing. Um, so we need to address that. So we address that by the use of various types of visual tools. One of them is the type of light or color that we're using. Light in general, obviously, we know stimulates the brain. If we are doing specific parts of the visual field, it will only go to the right part of the brain and the visual networks. But the right brain also has specific frequencies that we're trying to induce. So if we want to induce a frequency, we want to use different colors or wavelengths of light at different bl blink frequencies. By, chain, by having different blink frequencies of the light and by using different wavelengths of colors, we literally can induce specific types of wavelengths in the brain. And that's what we're trying to do ultimately. What we're trying to do is we're trying to change the brain waves. We know people have heard things like delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. This just means different frequencies of brain waves and networks need to be on the same frequency band to communicate like a walkie talkie or a radio. And so we need to tune those in. So the eye lights is a great tool that was developed by a friend of mine, Dr. Peter Gillet years ago, you looking at different colors of lenses and different colored lights that work in a hemi field way. So they, they can go only to one side of the brain or the other. So we use for the right brain, typically blue. We could also sometimes use violet or green, but mostly blue, which is a frequency that's shown in research to impact the right 
side of the brain. And we do that with all the modalities. So we use certain frequencies of sound or music, certain types of, you know, metronome sounds. We use different types of somatosensory, you know, tactile movement, balance, proprioception. And then in the cognitive realm, there are different types of academic things we can do or cognitive skill activities or exercises. Smell, smell is a hugely important stimulus that almost nobody checks sense of smell. In almost every kid with autism, they have an altered, unbalanced, or maybe even completely absent sense of smell. And smell is hugely important. But different types of smells impact the brain and the hemispheres differently. So it's using a combination of modalities that's specific for the child that really makes the difference in in, in our program. And we believe, you know, that is what helps us get the results we get. Yep. No, that's great. The uh, I know initially I was curious about, with especially with my son, he had the blue eyelights. And again, being kind of a biohacker, I've been trained to like, think of blue light as the enemy, especially when it comes to sleep and the like. But uh, but no, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's such power with light therapy, with the right type of light therapy. And I and you touched on, you know, this hemispheric concept because those eye lights aren't hitting both eyes this at the same time, right? It's just targeting right. one side. And so um I think that concept and the secret for this week, right, in terms of you know both you know, vertical and horizontal integration. Can can you t- expand a little bit about that concept? Because I know a lot of what comes out of people who vis- who work with you is that they wind up going away and they stop doing a number of things that they were already doing, interventions, you know, different therapies or supplements, because they were actually, even though they seemed like they were a good fit, they were actually perhaps making the situation worse, creating more of an imbalance. So can you just talk about horizontal and vertical integration and what you mean by that? Yeah. So when we talk about integration, obviously what we're trying to do is get different areas of the brain to integrate, to talk to one another, to communicate at an appropriate level. And so with the primitive reflexes, the brain normally builds from the bottom up. It starts and it's active in the medulla. This is where all of our autonomic nuclei come from that regulate gut function and uh, closing up of the gut and making sure we have right, proper digestive enzymes and blood flow and the balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic that's so important. And so the brain builds in these layers and then the whole brain grows and then it comes down and regulates everything. So that bottom up, top down regulation that is developmental is what we call vertical integration right we're integrating we're going up and then we're coming down and we're integrating at the brain stem level and we're integrating from the brain down at the same time both halves of the nervous system even starting in the brain stem do different things slightly and need to communicate and need to coordinate we have different areas of the brain doing different things that's great But if they don't coordinate together, if they're just randomly, haphazardly doing things, then that is chaos, right? This definition of chaos. And then we see things like, you know, when we look at stims or ticks and these random things kind of coming out uh, without really any, any proper controls, we have to have a balance of excitation and inhibition. And so the two sides of the brain and the hemispheres working together is what we call horizontal integration. And you can't really have one without the other. You have to have both. And so, you know, I always tell parents that, you know, if we we can't really fully get rid of these reflexes unless we also integrate the hemispheres. We can't integrate the hemispheres unless we get rid of the reflexes. So, you know, people out there, I see many people that have been doing various types of primitive reflex integration, and they're frustrated because they may have been doing it for years, and they're still there, and they still may be there very strong, and they don't understand why. And there's different reasons. One is, you know, exercises may not be always the most effective. You may need to directly stimulate the reflexes, which is how we start. 
but also because if you're not integrating the hemispheres, if that's not part of your treatment, then you're not going to fully, you know, promote this uh, horizontal, this, uh, this, this vertical integration. So what we find is that, you know, if you have an imbalance in the system and you do things equally to both sides, what happens is the side that's more active will respond quicker than the side that's less active. And that can create even more of an imbalance. So what we find, and, and I think what the research shows in the immune system as well, you know, it's not just about boosting the brain. It's not just about raising the immune function. It's about doing things in a very directed way and creating balance between different networks and within the immune system itself. Got it. No, that makes sense. And, it, and it, there is a sequence to it as well in terms of it, it's vertical first, right, to try to get that right. And then you can start focusing more on the horizontal. Is that correct? Like, yeah, we, we, we I mean, we need to do both really kind of simultaneously. And Lou Cozzolino, who's a uh, you know really well-known psychologist, and uh, I remember I talked to him years ago and he wrote a great book called uh, The the uh, neurobiology of psychotherapy and and in that he talked about the importance of simultaneous uh, horizontal and vertical integration um, he didn't really know how to do that but he knew that it was important and so this is something that you know i've really focused on um, as to what is the best way to be able to do this together and more and more we find that it's really you have to do both at the same time, you can't really do one or other. And it's not necessarily just sequential. We definitely start with the primitive reflexes first, but then very quickly, we're even when we do the primitive reflexes, when we're stimulating the reflexes, we stimulate more on one side than the other, so that we're already starting to create a balance in the nervous system just by how we address these primitive reflexes. Okay, so you really are addressing both at the same time, but maybe maybe then where I'm getting hung up is that the way the body should be developing or naturally would develop would be this ver vertical integration first and then horizontal, right? And if that doesn't happen, then okay, well, what do we do about it? And the approach really is doing addressing both at the same time. Yeah, because by the time we see a child or an adult you know, that developmental process is already severely delayed sure. and both aspects of it are severely delayed and unbalanced. So we need to really address both at the same time um, to really, you know, create that both horizontal and vertical integration. Got it. Great. Well, then what, what, once we came up and spent the week with you, I know you did your assessments, you assessed, you know, really where my son Rye was with respect to these various primitive reflexes and kind of assessed where he was, which is, again, where I was surprised he had a lot of retained reflexes that I wasn't fully aware of. You also did, uh, you tested his uh, auditory processing, you, you tested his visual processing um, uh, academically as well. So you did a number of tests. I'll let you expand on what you usually do and why. Yeah. So, you know, what I developed is this field of functional developmental neurology um, or behavioral neuroimmunology. And so we need to measure function. So as best as possible, we want to be able to measure. When we say, you know, there may be an issue in the visual system, how do we know that? Well, we need to be able to do some tests to try to measure it. Um, if there's a problem in the in in auditory or hearing, you know, we need to be able to look at that and measure that. We need to look at different cognitive skills and academics and look at right versus left brain skills. So we need to be able to get as best as possible some baseline. Now, most of these tests, you know, really can't be done in children that are functioning at a level, you know, under five years of age. But with the academic testing, it does go down to pre-K, it goes down to four. So, you know, there, there are certain children that we work with that may be very young, non-speaking, that we can't do a lot of objective tests. And that's where, again, the neurological exam that we do is so important because that's where we can actually see are the reflexes there. And, you know, and we have ways of working with children that are going to be very resistant, right? I just spoke with a parent yesterday and, you know, they went to a couple of other doctors that 
are in the functional neurology realm, but don't really work with the more severely delayed kids that are really challenges in uh, to work with. And they went in there and they tried to work with their son and, and it just wasn't happening. And they both said, you know what, you got to see Melilla because, you know, this is beyond what we do. So for anybody worrying, well, my child, it may be really resistant if you touch them or go near them. That's what we work with every day, all day. So we we know how to be able to go about that. And we know how to train parents how to work with that, which is a huge issue. But ultimately, you know, we want to use as much objective data. I'm a researcher, right? And so I want to use data. I want to use real measurement tools that tell me you know, are we actually changing? I don't want to just look at symptoms of behavior. We're not looking just to manage symptoms. We're looking to change the brain. We're looking to changing things on a long-term basis. So everything that we use is a way of saying, okay, are we using this modality because we need to? And is there a visual processing and uh, issue? Is there an auditory processing? Is there a smell or tactile processing issue? And, you know, what, where are, where is the child, you know, academically, we had um, this young man and everybody knows that, you know, your son was just unbelievable. He was great, such a great kid, but, you know, as they get older, they can be pretty challenging. We had this young man and he was 23 years old and, um, you know, he was on the autism spectrum when he was seven, he wasn't speaking. The mother has done a great job with him. Um, But one of the things we did was, you know, we tested him with the Wyatt. So the Wexler Individual Achievement Test is the gold standard to really look at brain function from a standpoint of saying, where are certain skills like reading and math actually at? You know, what is the age or grade level? When we say there's a maturity imbalance, how do you measure that? Well, this is one of the ways we can objectively measure it. And this young man was reading at a fifth grade level, word reading, which is a left brain skill. But his reading comprehension, the right brain skill was at first grade. So there was this big gap and obviously this huge gap from being 23, right, where he should be. So he should be at a college level. Um, Over the past six months, we've worked with him. He's been incredibly diligent at home doing his activities. His goal was to drive a car and get a job. And um, so we retested him and he was now at 10th grade reading, word reading and ninth grade reading comprehension. He went up eight years in reading comprehension in six months as a 23 year old male. Now, the only way we would know that is by measuring it. Now, it's absolutely translating. His mother was going on and recorded a video for us and how he's so different. And now he's actually going for his, his driver's test. And the mother said he absolutely will pass it. And then the next thing is he wants to get a job and he wants to actually get his own apartment. And, you know, and this these are things they would have never thought possible even, you know, a year ago. And so using those objective measurements, not only to show it to the parents, but when this young man saw what he was capable of now and saw the difference because of his hard work, you know, it's life changing. And he just doubled down. And now he's like, I want to get up to where I'm at a 20 year old level for everything. Right. And and I believe that he can do it. So, you know, that's where the objective measurements are so powerful. They direct what we do. But really, you know, real show us real lasting change. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's a fantastic story. I mean, he, that that young man is so driven, and that that just that's just a be- beautiful about what's what's really possible, um, legitimately. Again, with the right focus. And I know with my son, I mean, he's you know, a lot of people ask, you know, our story like how he's progressed, and you know, he is he's in such a much better place than he ever was. Uh, and right now, though. Uh, I know his younger sister, who's about a year and a half behind him, just uh, just passed her driver's test, and he hasn't, and he can't, he wants to, but you know that's something where as much as he's progressed in so many ways, you know his focus, you know, it, it, you know he he gets focused on certain things, and just in terms of awareness being on the road, um, you know, I'm wanting him to be more prepared for something like that, which is why right. we feel like doing your program is going to help us with that fine tuning because uh, you know, we've done just like the parents you mentioned, you know, every parent 
is diving in, doing so much for their son. And we have as well. And we got better and better at figuring out what could be useful for him. Uh, but I know we've laid a foundation with the work we've done with, you know, taking nutrition seriously, living in a, a very uh, non-toxic environment, which takes a lot of effort. But we feel like a lot of what we've done up until now has really prepared him to really be able to benefit from the the work that um, that we're doing with your program. Oh, absolutely. And you can see it. You can see it in him. You see it in the kids that come in and the parents have done so much. And all of that is useful, right? It's just, we want to be able to refine it and really be able to address really what what the issues are as best as possible. And, you know, this young man, I mean, he was just so motivated and he put such an effort in. And you know that, you know, once they get out of high school, there's not a lot of services out there. And a lot of people believe, well, those young adults with autism, you're not really going to be able to do much for them. And and to be honest, if he if this young man wasn't motivated and really didn't want to do it, there's nothing we can do to make him do it. Right. And so that's why, you know, what you've built with your son is this idea that, you know, not to just uh, accept things and not to, you know, and, and not to lower his standard of what is possible. Um, that you've always raised and said, no, you know, we're not going to lower what we expect of him. And we're not going to let anybody around him expect less because what happens is you get to that level and now they get, they don't believe that anything can change. And, you know, let's face it, they're going to get a little lazy. If somebody else is going to do something for you, most of us are going to say, all right, you know, yeah, I can't do it. You do it for me. Um, and you've never done that with Rye. And, and we have many parents that we work with that they're like, they refuse to, you know, just say no. They always believe there's another level and another level level to get to. And that's, that's critical. You know, um, I understand the whole idea of acceptance and we want our kids to be accepted and we want the world to accept them. But uh, I don't want to accept the fact that there are these limitations that, you know, the brain can always change. And that we can always try to get to a different level. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's an excellent way of describing it. It's almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not. But no, a- accept your child exactly as they are. Love them. Um, you know, uh, there's nothing more important than that, especially to create a connection. You can't be connected with someone if you're judging them as less. So acceptance is super key while at the same time wanting more for them, not lowering standards, not believing what many of the people will tell you, you know, hey, to lower your standards, to to not be unrealistic. And that's where there's acceptance with determined action to meet your child where they are, meet their needs, and to address what might be at the root of what's going on with them, which again, your whole method is about these imbalances that there's ways of helping your child to have greater balance, better integration, uh, which then will translate into those things that you're really hoping for, whether it's behaviorally or in terms of capabilities, speech, the, the, the list goes on. And I know you're, you're, you do specialize now more so in the more complicated cases. Yes. Yes. You know, that was always my, my goal. You know, when I started brain balance, it was, you know, um, cases that weren't as severe or as complicated, but my goal was always to get there. And that's really what the Malulo method is. And that's the difference between it and work that I've done in the past, like the brain balance centers. Um, And even, you know, my, I have my third edition of disconnected kids coming out next year. And it's very different. There's a lot of additions because, you know, again, at 60 years old, I'm I'm still doing a, a PhD, a doctoral study to try to get to the next level for myself. You know, that's the whole thing. You always have to walk your talk, right? With your kids, you have to be the example. You can't push them and say, hey, you can do it if you're not willing to do it yourself. And, you know, we've published more research this year. I've published about 100 papers, but we're, we're published probably 10 papers just this year alone. So I'm not slowing down. This is motivating me more. And, you know, working with the most challenging cases 
and knowing that we can work with them and get reproducible results. And there's no one that we can't work with at any age group from little babies to 70, 80 year old, you know, people. And that's what we're doing now. And, you know, that to me just, I mean, I love, I'm so excited every day to be here and do this and see what we can do. And we're always looking to get to the next level and how do we get better? And that's why I teach. I just taught my course this weekend here in New York. And, you know, so all of this, is about, you know, me learning more, getting better to be able to add more value. I think that's all we can do in life. And that should be our goal is to add as much value before we leave as possible. And that never stops, right? And always getting better and adding, you know, more to your knowledge base. And, you know, and I'll be doing this till the day I die. And, uh, you know, I'll be I'll be happy. Yep. No, you and me both. I'm going to continue doing this work. And I think what you just commented on is is extremely important because what you're touching on is kind of a growth mindset, constantly learning. And yes, as parents, we need to be able to do that and to model that for our kids. There's maybe nothing more important that you could be teaching them. And especially when it comes to choosing who's on your team, what practitioners, what advisors, parents do you have surrounding you? It is definitely a litmus test I have that whoever is advising, I want them to be someone who's constantly learning and growing. There's a lot of really good practitioners out there, you know, in a variety of modalities, but many of them have something they learned and they're doing the same thing that they were doing 20 years ago. And so if if the practitioner's learning and growth has stopped, um, it's very likely that perhaps they they may not be able to be really able to serve you. And so having practitioners who evolve, refine, and again, have that you know, uh, that appetite that you do, Dr. Malolo, to constantly learn, grow, adapt. And I love that a new version of your book's coming out. I will definitely look forward to reading that for sure. Um, so, uh, so it's just something to keep in mind, make sure the people on your team are learning and growing as well. Yeah. I think, you know, today there's so much out there with Instagram and social media and people making claims out there. And, you know, I think it's important for parents and patients to hold those professionals and say, have you ever done any research? Have you ever written anything like a book? And, you know, what, what, like, how do you know this? Like, how do you know that this works? Or are you doing functional measurements that actually, you know, show specific changes? Um, or is this just something that you, you know, you just kind of, kind of coming up with and just saying, you know, I mean, I think it's important to hold people to that standard um, because I believe, you know, that's what they should be doing. If you're a healthcare practitioner, I believe that you should be always trying to move forward, learn more, take more courses, get more degrees, you know, and ultimately I think you have a responsibility that if you're doing something that really is making an impact, you need to be able to educate people. You need to teach a course. You need to do research to prove it. You should, you know, write a book or something that can help people move, move forward. So I think that's something that, you know, it's real easy to get kind of, uh, you know, um, to say anything on on Instagram, but you have to be able to kind of really put your money where your mouth is. Yep. No, fully agree. And uh, and I think with the visit that we had, which was uh, at this point, I think it was last month. Now with what we're doing with you, we have virtual consults to kind of connect and to see when we have one scheduled in a couple of days to see how rise progressing whether there's any changes because otherwise what we're doing at home is a home program or exercises to stimulate those reflexes uh we have something that we're using uh, which is called interactive metronome which i think you, you might want to explain what that is in terms of these it almost from a rise standpoint it's a game he's he's basically doing games and video games generally aren't necessarily something that's positive but in this case it's part of the is learning and growth but we're doing these at-home exercises and we're checking in periodically with you to see how he's progressing. And then at some point we'll be up again for a return visit so you can do your assessments again, see what's changed. And the, the measurement concept, by the way, I love. That's what I used to do for a living was being able to measure how well things were working at these big, big behemoth banks and then re-engineering the processes to improve. So the fact that you're focused on measurement 
it is true. If you can't measure it, you really can't improve it. And love that you we have some benchmark uh, data to be able to track rise progress. But can you talk a little bit about the the metronome? Yeah, sure. Well, again, uh, it comes down to changing timing and frequencies. And obviously, movement is the single most important thing. You know, movement is what created brains on our planet to begin with. Movement is what creates brains initially. And that's why, you know, anything that affects movement or the quality of movement, like retained reflexes, um, is so impactful on the brain. And so being able to change the coordination and the timing and the rhythm of movement um, the interactive metronome is a tool that was developed really in the late 90s and has really perfected and really gotten much better and really, as you said, become more and more gamified, but is a great tool. There's very few tools out there that can actually change in the brain and in the body. And it's one of the proven tools that Olympic athletes use and high level athletes, but for therapy, I, mean, I was one of the first users of it. I started using it, I think, in 1999, and we did some research on it years ago as well in regard to ADHD. But it is a great tool that is about being able to create coordination between both sides of the body and using time and sound. Everybody knows of a metronome is a sound, right? And you can set a timing so it's a way of coordinating things like people in a band that aren't actually connected. How do we actually connect areas of our brain together that aren't actually physically connected to one another? And the way to do that is really through time. Time, space and time is really the way the brain really communicates with one another because it's fast, it's instantaneous, and the brain doesn't want anything that's going to slow it down. And so... How do we change that, that spatial temporal timing pattern? The interactive metronome is interactive, which means that it not only, if you said to somebody, hey, do some clapping to a sound, that's great. But how do they know if they're actually accurate? How do they know if they're ahead of the sound or behind the sound or how close they are? The interactive metronome measures that in milliseconds and can tell you on a real time basis speed up, slow down, you know, you're right on target. And so it helps the, the individual to connect with their body in a way and know that they're moving it. And in doing that, they're literally changing the coordination and timing in their brain. So it's, again, another great tool. And when we combine that with visual stimulation and it's auditory and movement and tactile and, you know, other things, vibration, it, it just becomes very powerful. Yeah, that and it's interesting to witness too, because my son has a number of things going on while he's doing that. And from his standpoint, it's just a game that he enjoys playing, but there's so much that's going on. And again, from his perspective, it's all very enjoyable. There's nothing off-putting about it. And uh because of that, it's easy for us to be consistent and to do it every day. And he's making continual progress. So yeah, we'll look forward to our checkpoint with you. And uh, and again, we just really wanted to you know, lift the curtain a little bit on what this looks like for people who wanted to better understand what this program involved. And again, from their perspective, um, uh, how it works. Yeah, and what we're doing is, and again, something like that, it's also measurable. There's normative data on how fast someone should be for an age group. So we can use it as an initial test, as follow-up tests. And so what we're doing, when someone comes to our center, we look at everything, right? We do a lot of sensory motor work, but we also do a lot of really high level neuroimmunology and biomedicine. It's a very important piece of what we do. We'll look at things like EEG and we, we can do things like neurofeedback and specific cognitive training. We do academic training. We do cognitive skills. Um, you know, we're looking at everything. We're not just looking at one piece and we're looking at how it all integrates together into an individual because that's real. That's how we work. We don't have just, there isn't just one issue and we don't need to get just one thing better. We need to get it all better. It all needs to work together. So you can't look at one piece and think, you know, that's going to give you all of the answers. You need to look at everything. And, and I'm always looking 
at what is the next tool? You know, I just found another tool that for vagal stimulation. And, you know, when we look at the immune system, a lot of the, the current research is really looking at electrical stimulation of the nervous system in the brain to affect inflammation and look at the immune system. There's a doctor named Kevin Tracy who's doing tremendous work in this area. And this is something that we've been, I've been looking at for a very long time. And people don't realize like things like inflammation, that is a neurological reflex. It's governed by the by the brain and the immune system. And, you know, people talk about, you know, stimulating the vagus nerve, but how do you do that? And again, there's a new tool that we're looking at and working with that has some really good research behind it. So I'm looking, always looking for the next, the next best tool and how we can add that and integrate it with what we're doing. Yeah, well, that's the growth mindset at work. And 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 I love that you when you say that you're doing, you know, looking at everything. That is really powerful because with the idea that what it results in, like the plan that we have for Rye is like, you looked at everything and now we have a plan of what makes sense to do now. Because something like neurofeedback you mentioned, which we've done in the past, neurofeedback could be great, but not now. Like so not there's, now. there's a right. sequencing about this foundation. So, uh, so again, we feel great about our plan. We look forward to catching up with you. And uh, again, we'll give uh, updates through this podcast as we move forward. But, uh, but you know, we're just very excited to be doing this program. Uh, appreciate you and your staff. Look forward to getting back up there in person. And again, just thanks so much for uh, for sharing this with our listeners. Hey, we can't wait to see you, but, you know, nothing against you, but my staff just can't wait to see Rye. So they love you, but he's the star here. He's just awesome. He's amazing and funny. And yeah, he's just a great kid. You've done a wonderful job. And again, everything you walk, your talk, you and your wife, by doing this, I mean, you're obviously giving him a reference and example and, and that's, you know, it shows in him. So thank you very much. I can't wait to see you again. Thanks for spreading the word here. You bet. And again, we, I appreciate those words, but uh, I can't say enough how amazing all the people you have at your office are. And I'm not just saying that like everyone from the person who greets you at reception to all the other people on your team. uh, My son was loving it because of how truly welcomed and and how connected he immediately felt with. So you just, you've assembled an incredible team. I think, I know you take great pride in that. I do. I do. I think that's what people deserve. I mean, the people that come from all over the world, New Zealand, Australia, and come here and come here for anywhere from a week to to three, four months, the sacrifices they make. And we never take that for granted. And I never let my staff, you know, take it for granted. And we we want everybody to feel like they're home, like they're like we, you know, this is a family. And and I have these young dynamic therapists and doctors and they love doing what they do and they see the results every day. And so, you know, I think it's, um, you know, that's what parents and families deserve. They deserve the best from us. And, and that's what they're going to get when they come here. Fantastic. Well, couldn't agree more. And again, thank you so much. Look forward to our next conversation. Okay, Len. Thank you.